Joshua Heinz is currently a member of the Board of Directors of the Robert H. Jackson Center, serves as a trustee to Syracuse University, serves as the co-chair of the advisory board for the Bernard Blatt Institute at Syracuse University, and is a member of the Board of Directors to the Global Universal Design Commission, uh, Incorporated. Mr. Heinz also served as uh, chair of the Syracuse University College of Law Board of Advisors. Mr. Heinz <coughs> retired from the law firm of Gilberti, Stinziano, Heinz, and Smith, PC, in Syracuse, New York, uh, where he practiced for 31 years in energy, commercial, and industrial projects. Some of these projects included uh, brownfield redevelopment, power generation, solid waste management, and surface mining facilities. Mr. Hines has a passion for disability rights advocacy, specifically inclusive design, and developing buildings and environments to ensure universal accessibility. For instance, in 2007, Mr. Hines also was a sponsor and presenter at the Syracuse University uh, Women's School of Management's Entrepreneurship Boot Camp for <coughs> Veterans with Disabilities, a first of its kind project to train and empower disabled veterans to create and sustain an uh, entrepreneurial venture. In 2010, at a global conference on technology uh, and innovation for people with disabilities in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Mr. Heinz delivered the keynote address on universalizing universal design. In 2011, at a conference on disability in the workplace, marketplace, and supply chain, Mr. Heinz was a member on a panel on universal design, expanding markets, and increasing workplace productivity. Outside disability law, Mr. Heinz also initiated and organized the American Dream Forum's one and two events in 2006 and 2007, which engaged nationally uh, recognized experts in the areas of design, technology, finance, marketing, and development, an unprecedented level of dialogue and debate on the possibility of developing and marketing universal design concepts. Finally, Mr. Heinz has been a generous contributor to Acuity Watch, allowing our organization to spread the word daily about acuity and injustice throughout the world. With his help, we are able to be the voice of the voiceless. Please help me welcome Josh Heinz. It just seems like yesterday, as you said, David, we were having lunch, and uh, uh, it's one of it's one of the great pleasures of my life to uh, have an organization that is works so tirelessly for those who have no voices. Kyle said, "The prosecutors uh, represented throughout this room." really do do God's work, and uh, if you are uh, blessed with success, it's important that you give it back, and uh, I think that's one of the uh, founding principles of wanting to honor people like Sergei Nochecki. I think it's, uh, it's very hard to appreciate uh, very, very difficult circumstances, and I'm sure Bill will share those with us in his remarks, but it, it's just like one little small thing. Um, when I first came here, um, the former Nuremberg prosecutors were relating uh, their experiences at Nuremberg, and I thought to myself, they have been from the 40s forward without anybody celebrating them, and we ought to do something. So tonight, uh, obviously, we're uh, recognizing another recipient, and I'm really honored and humbled to be here. So thank you. In 2009, I normally don't take cold calls. Uh, I don't recognize them, and uh, my assistant will come in and say there's a there's a call from somebody, and I'll say, well, who is that and stuff. And I'm usually polite enough to maybe take it. And, uh, one day, uh, I received a call from a, a William Browder, and uh, I thought to myself, who's this? Uh, and uh, just out of idle curiosity, I guess, I, I uh, said hello, and uh, my life has been uh, changed ever since. Uh, I've had the honor of, uh, of working in a very small way, uh, supporting Bill's important work 
in seeking justice. You know, you've heard me in some other forums talk about the righteous fury of representing those who have been torn apart by war and conflict. And uh, I had that righteous fury in Sierra Leone. Uh, and Bill, I could tell, had that righteous fury. And as I began to understand the case of Sergei Medetsky and the horror that he went through, uh, and the single focused drive of his former boss, William Browder, who was the founder and CEO of the Hermitage Capital Group, <coughs> uh, the largest uh, capital fund in Russia during that particular time. Uh, I was almost moved to tears and have supported William Browder for since 2009 to try to assist in getting the world to understand not just about Sergei, but just the horror story that's going on in Russia under Vladimir Putin. Uh, Sergei had the courage to stand up to that and he lost his life because of it. Uh, and we'll talk more about Sergei in a, in a minute. But I just want to highlight, as I introduce Bill, who will talk about Sergei, uh, this is a man with passion himself, and is also worthy, uh, frankly, of the Heinz Award in and of himself. He has traveled the world. He has now focused his entire life on this, and in working for human rights. Uh, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce you uh, to my friend uh, and fellow human rights advocate among all of us, uh, Bill Browder. Bill? Thank you for that lovely, generous introduction. Um, uh, thank you all for, for uh, coming here to honor Sergey tonight, and Joshua and your family. Thank you for, for um, <clears throat> supporting supporting this uh, program. I thought I would I would spend a few minutes um, telling you a little bit of my story and a lot of Sergey's story, so you understand why um, Sergey is being awarded tonight. Um, I'm not a, uh, I'm, I'm sort of a fish out of water here, I'm not a lawyer, um, uh, uh, I'm a businessman, I'm a, I'm a financier. Um, I made a decision many, uh, several decades ago when the Berlin Wall came down that I wanted to be an investor in Russia. And, um, and so I set out to do that. Um, I moved to Moscow. and. Um, one thing led to another, and I ended up becoming the largest foreign investor in Russia, with four and a half billion dollars invested in the Russian stock market. Um, one of the things I didn't anticipate um, was how bad the corruption would be. I knew corruption was bad, but I didn't know how bad it would be. And, and uh, when I got there, I started to um, uh, complain about it. And uh, I started complaining about it um, uh, at roughly the same time uh, that Putin had come to power. And uh, uh, it turned out that I was complaining um, for a brief period of time about people um, who he, he was fighting with himself. Um, the guys who were stealing money from me were stealing power from him. And so they, um, and so for, for, for a period of time, um, every time I'd complain about corruption, Putin would step in to do something about it. And uh, uh, until, um, until at the end of 2003, uh, Putin, arrested uh, the richest oligarch in Russia, um, a guy named Michael Bartakovsky, and put him in jail. And all the other rich guys in Russia um, saw him in jail and thought to themselves that they didn't want to go to jail, but they, they didn't also want to go to jail. And so they went to Putin and said, what do we have to do to make sure we don't go to jail? And uh, he said 50%. Not to the Russian government, not to the Russian presidential administration, but 50% to his own pocket. And at that point, Putin became the richest man in, in, in the world. And all of my complaining was no longer in his interests, but uh, against his interests. And um, uh, about a year later, when I was flying back to Moscow after living there for 10 years, I was stopped at the border. I was uh, detained overnight. And I was deported and declared a threat to national security. Um, I knew that when the Russians turn on you, they don't tend to do so lightly. They didn't tend to do so with, with extreme prejudice. And so um, I did two things. At the time, I uh, evacuated my staff, and um, I sold all the uh, shares of every company, or of 
everything in our portfolio so they couldn't seize our money and um, our, arrest our people. So I got everybody out, I got all the money out, and I thought I was done with Russia. And it turns out that they were just about to get started with me. And 18 months after I was expelled, uh, 25 police officers raided my office in Moscow, and uh, 25 more officers raided the office of, of an American law firm I worked with um, called Firestone Duncan. And um, at the, the, the officers were specifically looking for the stamps seals the certificates for the investment companies to which we had invested all of our money. And at the law firm's office, um, they found those documents and they seized them. And even though our companies were empty, we had sold everything we had in the country, um, the companies using the documents, I should say, the, the, using the documents that were seized from the law firm, they put these corrupt officials um, fraudulently transferred our companies out of our name into the name of a man who had been convicted of murder and let out of jail early by the police put his name on these documents. I was very terrified by, by the idea that the police would be um, seizing documents and stealing documents. I hired the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, which was at the time a young man, 35 years old, named Sergei Magnitsky. Um, Sergei Magnitsky was, a, was a, um, a gentleman and a very, very smart lawyer. And he was the kind of person who could do 10 things in the time it took other lawyers to do one. As, as people of the law, I'm sure you know that when you come across someone really good and smart, and that's what Sergey was. And I hired Sergey, and I said to him, could you please um, figure out what's going on here? And uh, Sergey went and investigated, and he came back, and he said, that there were, he said, I figured out what was going on here. There were two goals of this raid and of this theft. The first was to steal your money, which the authorities didn't succeed in doing. Um, the second um, was to steal all of the taxes that you paid in the previous year to the Russian government. We paid $230 million of taxes. And through a complicated scheme that I won't uh, go into in detail tonight, uh, the, um, this group of corrupt officials stole $230 million of taxes that we paid, not from us, but from the Russian government. And Sergei, um, was an incredible patriot, in addition to being a good lawyer. And he thought that this was the most shocking thing he had ever seen, that people working for the government were stealing tax money, his own country's money. And so, as a patriot, he went and testified against the people who raided the office who were involved in this scam. And I was, I was very, uh, very worried about him doing this, and, and uh, he said to me, Bill, this is not 1937. Um, you know, uh, the law will protect me. There's no, nothing to worry about. And um, so Sergei testified. And one month after he testified, um, on November 24th, 2008, uh, the same police officers he testified against came to his home at 8 in the morning in front of his wife and children, um, tore his apartment up, and then arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with uh, 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They moved him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony against the police officers and they wanted to get him to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million himself. And he did so on my instructions. And now, if, if, you, would, if, if you asked me how I would behave in a situation where I've been tortured like this and presented with this type of situation, I don't know what I would do. And I think if you had asked Sergei in advance of him being in prison what he would do, he probably wouldn't know the answer. Um, but when Sergei was put to the test, when Sergei was, was basically told to perjure himself and bear false witness, the um, moral pain of doing that as, as a man of, of integrity was greater than the physical pain that he was suffering. He refused to buckle. And they didn't expect that. Everybody buckles in Russia. But Sergei just refused to. 
and things got worse and worse and worse, and, and very tragically, after six months of this, his health broke down. He ended up losing 40 pounds. He developed terrible pains in his stomach, and he was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones, and needing an operation, which was scheduled uh, for the 1st of August, 2009. One week before the operation was supposed to happen, um, again, we came to him with this Faustian bargain, and again, he refused. And in retaliation for his refusal, they abruptly moved him from a prison that had medical facilities to a maximum security prison that didn't have any medical facilities. And one of the, and this prison was considered to be one of the worst prisons in Russia. They move him to this prison, at which point his health completely breaks down. He goes into an incredible downward spiral of pain and suffering. And he and his lawyers write 20 different requests for medical attention to every different branch of the criminal justice system in Russia. And most of the requests were ignored, but some of them even came back in writing rejected, and they refused him all medical attention. Things got worse and worse and worse, and finally his body gave out. On the night, the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. On that night, the authorities at Butyrka didn't want to have responsibility for him, so they put him in an ambulance to another prison that had medical facilities. But when the ambulance arrived, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an, in an isolation cell, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him until he died at the age of 37, leaving the wife, two children, and his mother. I got the news on the morning the next morning at 7.45 a.m. in London on the 17th of November. And the news that I got was like a knife going right into my heart. Um, this man didn't die an accidental death. He died a sadistic, malicious death. Uh, he tortured for 358 days um, because he was my lawyer. And on that day, I made a vow to myself, to his family, and to his memory that I was going to make sure the guys who did this didn't get away with it. And I was going to use whatever time, energy, and resources I had to bring these people to justice. Now, one of the unusual things about this case is that Sergei wrote everything down. This, I don't think it's ever happened before, but he wrote 450 complaints in his 358 days in detention, documenting who did what to him, when, how, where, and why. And because of that, and, and, he, and unusually, or uh, surprisingly, they, the, the Russian system is so um, procedure-oriented that they allowed him to file these complaints, knowing that they would never do anything about them. But we got copies of all these complaints. And so we have these 450 complaints, which, which is like the most granular evidence uh, testimony from the grave that you could ever have. And I figured that that would be enough to put the people who, at least the, the most immediate villains in jail for torture and murder. But it turned out when we went public with this information that the Putin regime completely circled the wagons. Um, they exonerated every single person involved. They gave special promotions and state honors to some of the most complicit. And the only two people who have ever been prosecuted in this whole ordeal was three years after they killed Sergei Magnitsky. They put him on trial in the first ever trial against a dead man in the history of Russia. Not even Stalin did that. And they put me on trial as his co-defendant and sentenced me in absentia to nine years in prison. So it became obvious to me that, that we weren't going to get any justice in Russia, so we said to ourselves, let's try to get some justice outside of Russia. And uh, so I went to explore getting justice outside of Russia, and that's when I met David Crane. And, um, uh, it quickly became clear that, well, most of you who are in the business of crimes against humanity, um, there's a lot of other crimes below that level, and this was one of them, where um, I went and met um, uh, the head of the International Criminal Court and various others, and, and everybody said, I'm, I'm ter terribly sorry, it's a horrible story, but you know, there's no jurisdiction here. I tried, you know, uh, David and his legal um, students put together an analysis of universal jurisdiction and we couldn't find any place that properly um, applied universal jurisdiction. And I basically came to the conclusion um, that with the exception of maybe getting the State Department to issue a, 
uh, a line in their annual human rights report saying that this was a terrible crime. That was the only type of international justice that we were going to be able to get. And I just couldn't accept that. And so I looked at this whole situation. And I, if, if, if there's no concept of international justice for a crime like this, then we should invent one. And we looked at the crime that was committed. And this was a crime of money. This was a crime to, to cover up the theft of $230 million. And the people who steal this money, they don't like to keep it in Russia. They like to keep it in the West. They like to keep it in Swiss bank accounts, and English bank accounts, and New York bank accounts. They like to send their kids to boarding school in England. They like to send their girlfriends to Miami. They like to travel all over the world. They like to buy villas in the south of France. And, and it seemed to me that, that that is one thing that we could take away from these people. And so I, came, I went to Washington, and I met uh, Senator Benjamin Cardin, who's a Democrat from Maryland. I told him the story, and I, I met Senator John McCain, who's a Republican from Arizona. And, um, uh, and I asked them whether they would be willing to sanction, come up with some type of legislation to sanction the people who killed Sergei. And this is one of the few things in Washington that everybody could agree on, that we shouldn't allow Russian tortures and murderers to come to America. And um, in October of 2010, they introduced the Sergei Magnitsky Act to Congress. And it had this remarkable effect that once it, once it was on the books, um, all sorts of other victims started coming forward and said, saying, you found the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. Can you, can you um, sanction the people who killed my father? Can you sanction the people who killed my brother, my uncle, my aunt, my sister? And after about 10 of these approaches, the senators realized they were on something much bigger than Sergei Magnitsky. And um, uh, they ended up adding 65 words to the law, which included all other gross human rights abusers in Russia. And, uh, and then the whole thing snowballed. And in November of 2012, it went for a vote in the Senate. And it passed 92 to 4. Um, it went for a vote in the House of Representatives. It passed 89%. And President Obama um, has now <laughs> signed it into law. And there are 32 people on the Sergei Magnitsky list who will have their assets frozen and their visas canceled uh, for what they did to Sergei. It's not justice in the way I'd like it to be, but it's a hell of a lot better than total impunity. Um, I'm proud to say that this was such a good idea and so, something so, so, um, such a good technology for our times. All these kleptocrats, many, many human rights abuses are committed out of kleptocracy and kleptocrats come from everywhere, and they're all, all, they, all their money is scattered about the world. The worst thing you can do to them now is freeze their money and ban their visas. And so um, a couple months ago, the same senators who proposed the Russian Sergei Magnitsky Act have proposed a global Sergei Magnitsky Act. I'm happy to say it's passed the um, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and will hopefully go for a vote in this Congress. And I should finish up by saying that um, uh, you know, there's nothing that we're ever going to be able to do to bring Sergei back, but um, but his name and his plight haven't gone unnoticed, and, and they've created a legacy which will hopefully create consequences, like the consequences that you have all created in, in, the, uh, in these tribunals for bad guys, and those consequences will hopefully prevent some people, at least, from committing these terrible crimes and perhaps saving some lives. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, um, Heinz family, for, for this uh, honor for Sergey, and, and um, I will leave it to David.
Я хочу поблагодарить всех тех людей, которые приняли решение наградить Сергея этой премией. Like to say thank you to all the people who decided that this award should go to Sergey. Сергей был честным, честным, смелым человеком. Он он отдал свою жизнь, отстаивая отстаивая свои принципы. Сергей был очень честным и courageous man and he died standing for what he thought was right and standing for his principles. I met people who were Sergei's inmates and they said that we're alive because of Sergei's death and because of what he gave for us. И они говорили, говорили, что мы не уверены, что мы могли бы поступить точно так же, как поступил Сергей. Когда мы собираемся с, с, с друзьями, знакомыми и с незнакомыми э, людьми, то мне кажется, что Сергей находится э, среди нас. When we gather with all the people we know, with all the people we don't know, with our family and friends. I always feel like Sergey is with us. Мне кажется, и сейчас Сергей нас видит и благодарен за то, что его помнит. I think Sergey can see us right now. He's very grateful for what's going on currently. Мне бы очень хотелось, чтобы никому не пришлось пережить то горе, которое пережила наша семья. I would never anyone wish. I would never wish anyone to experience the same thing our family experienced. И поддержка многих людей в разных странах, она помогает нам справиться с этим горем. The support of so many people from all the different countries is helping us get through this horrible thing, and we're all grateful for that. Еще раз большое всем спасибо. Thank you. Thank you.